Good afternoon and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Future of Finance Wealth Management discussion. I shall now hand you over to Dominic Hobson, our moderator and our expert panel. Many thanks. Hello everybody and welcome to our webinar on technology and wealth management. I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. It's my privilege to moderate our discussion this afternoon. Wealth management has recently attracted the attention of the private equity industry. This can be seen as an accolade for its growth prospects, but it could also be read as an indictment of its costs or its structure, its scale or its operational efficiency. I suspect a bit of both is probably the right answer. To help us explore what digital technology can do to help the wealth management industry both grow and become more efficient and therefore more profitable, I'm joined by a number of experts in the field. Andy Knox is a former chief of staff at, uh, at Man Group, now consulting to asset and wealth managers on strategy, sales, branding and technology. Colin Bennett is head of digital distribution at GAM Investments, in which role he's built the digital sales and marketing teams and the systems, the content and the channels to support them. Colin is one of the authors of, and the title is self-explanatory, Wealth Tech Book. Maya Imberg is a senior director, thought leadership and analytics at WealthX, which specializes in the collection and analysis of data about wealthy individuals around the world. The data is used by a variety of organizations selling to the sector, including nonprofits. Peter Coleman is chief commercial officer at Wealth Wizards, a former CEO of Positive Solutions, which was sold by Igon to Intrinsic. Peter has considerable experience of helping wealth managers realize the value in their businesses. Now, in addition to our panelists, we do, of course, also have you, our audience, and all of us encourage all of you watching or listening to submit your questions and comments throughout this webinar using the Q&A or the chat functionality you'll find at the bottom of your screens. We will not save up uh, your questions and comments to the end, but we will look to air them and answer them as we go along. We've got lots to talk about, so let's get straight underway. I'm going to begin by asking uh, our panelists about the current state of the industry. Uh, and Colin, perhaps I could come to you first. Do you think the wealth management industry is undergoing some kind of systematic or structural change at the moment? Or is it uh, just business as usual, but a little more bumpy than uh, we would normally expect? That's, that's one question. And secondly, could give us a view perhaps on whether you think the pandemic is accelerating uh, or indeed decelerating what what is actually going on i can do thanks dominic it's not a question i often get asked but um it's one i have a view on and i think it is systemic i think there are some fundamental things happening um, around the world at a macro level that will be affecting wealth management and people's wealth you know is wealth health is wealth monetary and I think, you know, when you see things developing, you see that really wealth ecosystems are building and those are being underpinned by um, advances in technology, the way that people demand new things, but also the impact they want their, their wealth to have. And that is fundamentally um, altering the services and the capabilities that wealth managers need to deliver. And that kind of ties into COVID. You know, there was a recent study from McKinsey that, you know, COVID is accelerating digital transformation by 25 times. You know, things are getting faster. And I think, you know, if you already didn't have something underway, you need to start, you know, that face-to-face -face relationship side of things, which was so fundamentally important to wealth management around trust, you know, trust your advisor, trust your wealth manager. It's not questioned, but it's a different paradise a different dynamic that needs to be delivered via digital means and that really puts it to the fore where where you need to get better you need to make sure it works Maya you've heard Colin say that the industry is experiencing and needs to experience or undergo digital transformation COVID for obvious reasons has accelerated that uh, digital connection between clients and wealth managers what does your does your data indicate something similar that this is actually a secular change taking place in the industry and not a variant on business as usual i think it's a, a tricky one i mean i think it's kind of early days to see the the data kind of showing that uh in terms of you know what the wealthy actually um, want to do in terms of uh you know how they want to work with their wealth manager but absolutely i think you know, the last five years or so, it, we're seeing a, a really kind of uh, challenge to the you know traditional way in which the wealthy liaise with their wealth manager um, and what they want from from you know a wealth management provider. And, and absolutely, the pandemic has 
accelerated all those all those shifts. Um, but I think, nevertheless, you know, it's it's really about what people want from their wealth manager, and, and the wealthy will continue to value that face to face advice. Trust will continue to be paramount. Um, but absolutely, the way in which that's delivered is going to be shifting. Mm-hmm. Andy, do you share that view that this is? actually a, 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 a pretty far-reaching structural change in the technology platform basis on which the wealth management industry operates? Yeah, look, I think, I think uh, the wealth management, management industry isn't immune from the, all of the changes that are sweeping cross-sector, basically. And if you look at the stats, uh, and I'm a big fan of the reportal um, stuff that comes out, I mean, social media adoption jumped more than 12% in the last 12 months. E-commerce gone up... Um, uh, you know, over 70% of people now acquiring things on a kind of e-commerce basis. And, and, the, and there's this interesting point about, I think, I think the catchphrase is a rebalancing of digital audience demographics, which I think is, is jargon for more people are getting more used to using technology. And the wealth management industry is, um, is, is, not, immune, is not immune from those changes. I mean, I, I, do, think, I do think there is something quite um, intrinsic to wealth management, particularly at the higher end, particularly in the, at the ultra space, where people feel, particularly in, in times like COVID, feel reassured by human, the human voice. But I think, you know, I mean, Peter can speak to kind of wealth, wealth wizards and the kind of ro- robo side of things. I think, I think that the players in those space are doing really interesting stuff, opening up advice to vast ways of the community which have not been uh, historically advised. And so I think basically across the spectrum of, of wealth, there are really interesting uh, things happening and they're all, they're all pretty much tech enabled. Well, I'd like to, uh, it's interesting what you're saying about technology, that it's, that it's all front end, uh, the Twitter traffic and, and e-commerce picking up and all the rest of it. And I'd like to come back to the, the operational side of the industry and digitization a, a bit later on. But before we do that, perhaps I could, I could bring you in at this point, uh, Peter. I said at the outset that, that the private equity industry has started to get interested in, in wealth management. It sees it as a, as a, as a classic roll up or consolidation story. Um, what explains that? Is it that the industry is going to be transformed by technology and that will transform its profitability? Or do they see some other kind of, of opportunity? What is the opportunity the private equity industry sees in this? Uh, can, you, can you explain to us what you think is getting them excited? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, before I, I I've been a director in um, financial services businesses for 20 years now, but before that, I was actually a corporate financier uh, and worked quite closely with private equity. So I think it's it's worthwhile, first of all, looking at what private equity businesses will want in order to invest. And the, the fundamentals don't really change. So private equity businesses buy to sell, typically over a time frame of two to six years. And then they're actually obliged by their mandate more often than not to actually sell, so they have to. And if you look at what they what they look for, and then compare each of those criteria with with our industry, it's no great surprise that private equity are really interested in us right now. So they always look for a good market. So we have increasing wealth in the UK. We have uh, we have a, an aging population. So we have more raw customers um, for wealth managers and advisors generally. And they're always looking for a good product or a good service. So I think it's well, well reputed that, um, that the UK is, is a leader in financial services generally. We're also you know, highly regulated. So that inherently makes us uh, higher quality, looking for strong management teams. And I think gone are the days when there were 250,000 advisors in the UK. The RDR, the, one of the one of the the sort of unwitting effects, if you like, of the RDR were that it increased professionalism dramatically and increased uh, qualifications and so on. So if you look at strong operations, strong financials, a great service, uh, a great market, it, it, it's no it's no great surprise. And then if you look at uh, the the final factor would be what what will what will the the investee use that money for and 
right now, because of the advances in technology, um, you need to get to scale. You don't have to. You can be a niche player, and that's fine. But in order to be of long-term value to a private equity investor, you need to be um, of scale. And if you can use that money to consolidate or to invest in technology, then all the ingredients are there. Uh, Peter, you, you've said that private equity buys to sell. You've said that one of their goals will be to get these businesses to scale. Now, is that consolidation process, is what we're really describing, is that going to be good for the customer? What's um, going to get out of it? Yeah, well, uh, it, it, it should be good for the customer. It depends, as ever, on the way any significant change is executed. So what, what's, what's actually good for, for the customer? Well, it's, it's, um, it's, it's choice, it's better service, it's better use and choice of technology. It's a great uh, user interface and user experience, all of those things. And, um, and ultimately, you want to make sure that your, your, your wealth is properly invested and safe. And consolidation, you know, done well and done correctly, should mean that a customer gets all of that. But as ever, if it's not, if it's executed poorly, then it's not always good for the customer. You didn't mention price. Is the fat margins in wealth management one of the things that's attracting the private equity industry? Well, I mean, I, I, I'd like to think maybe naively that, you know, the 1980s are gone and, you know, the greed is good philosophy has, has gone forever. And if you remember, I think, was it... Um, was it was it John Major uh, intru introducing the stakeholder economy, where actually you know we now look at all different aspects of stakeholders in our society. So what should happen? What should happen when you've got consolidation uh, and improved profitability is some of that should go back into some of it should go back into price. Some of it should go back into technology. Um, and if it's not in the long term, then I, I think that's, well, I think that's a very short term view. Um, but there are all sorts of models out there. It was Tony Blair, in fact, who was a great stakeholder was enthusiast. Yeah, was he made a great speech about it in Singapore in 1996, which I remember very vividly. Um, but I, John I Major, them, might as well have been John Major, you're quite right. Yeah. Um, let's talk a bit about, about, about the role technology is, is, is playing in this. Um, and Colin, could you give us a sense of, um, as I said to Andy a while back, the, the, he mentioned a lot of technological developments uh, and data developments at the front end um, could you give us a sense of, of how well matched, I suppose, the platforms that wealth managers are operating off now? I know this is an impossible question given the fragmentation and size of the industry, but are there sales and marketing platforms in a good place to accommodate digitization? And are there operational platforms in a good place to uh, accommodate the digital age? Or does one need more work than the other? Or do both need a lot of work? Again, an interesting question, I think, yeah. Business can happen as usual. Um, you know the, the state of people's systems are adequate, but if you were to ask, you know, in the future, are they fit for purpose? I would um, probably say no. Um, people are moving in the right directions. They're moving to the right platforms, moving to the right connected systems. But expectations from clients are changing. They need different sort of presentation layer, if you like. They also need different capabilities pushed up through those layers to service them in, in a digital way. You know, to, talking to the point earlier around, you know, the need for scale, you know, hyper-personalization, those type of things don't happen easily. You know, you can put in simple technology stacks that work very well and they currently do, but actually when you start trying to join and integrate those things, maybe through your own organization, um, you know, connecting different aspects, or more importantly in the future, connecting out to the ecosystems that are going to be developing to actually support the clients. The technology needs to be quite advanced really in order to support that, you know, whether it be open architectures, things that can support that integration. And if you look at the sort of standard stuff that's out there, you know, just standard marketing automation, the standard, um, you know, personalization, the content management systems, et cetera, you know, a lot of wealth managers will have those but maybe they're not as optimized as they would be, say, if you worked you know, at a Google or a Facebook or something like that, you know, and that's the step change that's kind of required and either internally or to actually integrate into something like that, 
And I do believe that the gaffers of this world will potentially be that interface layer to individuals at a mass level. Um, and a lot of product providers and wealth providers will either be orchestrating that in terms of delivering um, product content services and managing that interface. Um, and that's where a wealth manager will really you know, add the value. They become those fantastic wealth concierges, whether that wealth, as I said earlier, is health, is it, is it services? Are there other capabilities that bring it all together for that holistic offering? One of the things Peter mentioned was, was cybersecurity. You know, the customers expect the wealth managers to keep their assets safe. And that's becoming more and more of a, uh, a complex and potentially expensive area. I, I don't know whether you've got a thought on that, but, but I have yeah. a larger question for you, which is, as you've described very articulately, the problems which wealth managers face in building the, the dashboards and forms of communication, particularly on a mass scale, uh, which no. Peter was describing, uh, should 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 wealth managers be looking to outsource more of what they do? Are specialist providers going to emerge in this space to take care of things like your investor front end, your cybersecurity? Do those organisations already exist, and should they be used more than they are? They, they already do exist. Um, so, if that, on the security piece, I mean, the security is strong i mean it's a board level decision now you know there's committees they talk about it it's integrated right to the top you know if any wealth manager is not you know very proficient at cyber security uh, there's an issue and, and i wouldn't have thought many are exposed extreme but when you start outsourcing obviously your risk um, profiles and your vulnerable areas start getting increased so you know when you have those connections you have other third party providers you know, and, and from that sort of resilience point of view, but also from a risk perspective, when you're outsourcing those capabilities to third parties, you have to do some serious due diligence and your trust is then, you know, only as good as your weakest link, essentially. So you really do have to make sure those things work incredibly well, not from a procedural point of view, but also a technical point of view. And it's got to be bomb proof. Sorry, I didn't. I forgot your second part of the question. Very quickly. Uh, my, my second question was really: should should wealth managers be doing more outsourcing rather than less? Oh, but I think that's been co covered by that. You know, I think they are going through a, a process where, as other banks have gone through, where it's it's unbundled, and it will be unbundled by a vertical, etc. And you get your specialists, and then where you know the systemic change is that these things will come back into a, a, a holistic offering. You know, these experts at certain things will then be orchestrated by the wealth manager. And that needs the technical architecture behind it. It needs the data underpinning it. It needs the reporting underpinning all of that. And that is quite a complex thing. And if you put regulation on top of that as well, we talked about cross-border earlier, it does start getting very complex. And I do think, although the current systems and platforms exist, they have to step it up a bit to deal with those things. So our... our the sort of back-end providers like Pershing or platform securities under pressure to do more on the front end as well now for their clients, for their wealth management clients? Absolutely. I would have thought, you know, that that's where it, it's shown, you know, that that's the first thing and that is the interface, but you know, the old classic lipstick on a pig, you know, it, it only gets you so far, mm -hmm. you know, you do need that fully integrated product and capability all the way through the value chain. And those value chains are being compressed every day, you know, more and more. And we're not even, haven't even touched on things such as, you know, the promise of blockchain, distributed ledgers, those type of efficiencies that are, are, are way away, but those can come in. Uh -huh. Well, we'll come back to that. Uh, one other thing I wanted to, 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 to touch on before we leave the question of, of the current state of industry technology is, uh, is fintechs. Obviously, all sorts of fintechs are crawling all over this sector for much the same reasons as, as private equity firms are. Um, Peter, is there a, an obvious model by which you would advise wealth managers to work with fintechs? Should they form partnerships? Should they buy them? Should they try and kill them? What's the, what's the right answer for wealth management and fintechs? How do they meet that challenge? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, fintechs is a, is a, a, a yeah, occupies a very broad spectrum of different capabilities and functionality. So, um, Perhaps if I talk a little bit about the area that I've got well some some knowledge of rather than expertise, which is um, so the business that I work with um, 
uh, digitizes advice, um, and, and that's that's that that's the core of what we do. Um, but there are many other functionalities that technologies like ours can be used for. Um, I think I think the reality is for a wealth manager, a typical wealth manager, if, if there is one, is that they have a core off offering that they're really good at, and that's principally what they do. But that quite often um, mismatches with what their clients want. So their clients um, are maybe a time poor, um, perhaps they don't understand finances at all, and they actually see either their independent financial advisor or the wealth manager um, as a sort of catch-all for everything. And I remember when I was a sort of practicing chartered accountant, you know, relatives would ask me, you know, when they should sell their Marks and Spencer's shares, you know, like like you know, like I would know, you know. And I think I think that's I think that's um, that's one of the challenges that that wealth managers have always faced. So quite often when you get asked a question, which is fairly rudimentary and you're not that interested in it in truth, you feel obliged um, either to answer that or to do maybe to do a poor job or to do it unprofitably um, or just to pass it off to somebody else. And I think that's where technology can really help. So, so there, are, there are technologies now, um, certainly that, that, that we use, where you can do fairly rudimentary aspects of financial services in either a fully digitized way or um, in a hybrid way that will cut times by 75 or 80%. Um, and by using that technology, you can wrap the real personal service that wealth managers are pretty uniformly excellent at to really improve the service. So I think, I think answering the, the question directly, what, what model could could wealth managers use? Um, buy them. Well, I think it's um, I think investing is a, is a is a good thing, and I think I would always say that. I think the the, the industry is um, a long long way from from maturity. I think values will increase dramatically, um, but I think using technology to really enhance uh, client service will be a significant thing over the next five years. Okay, I'm getting a story here of, of outsourcing and technology and making you more efficient, freeing up time to, to, to do what you're good at, which is actually hang out with the with the clients and give them advice. And we'll talk a bit more about that in, in a minute. Um, but but Andy, perhaps I could, I could pick up the technology thread with you now, because you mentioned Twitter, for example, a, a little while back. What digital marketing tools and what digital sales channels do you think wealth managers should be using these days? Um, well, look, I think um, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to go back a little bit to the, to the private equity question initially and just say, look, I think one of the reasons why private equity is, um, is so interesting in the sector is there is so much to arbitrage, right? You've got sticky relationships. I mean, the, 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 the common denominator for the wealth management industry is, you've typically got client longevity about 12 years versus asset management three years. So you've got the raw material of, of sticky relationships to, to kind of work with. And, you know, as Peter was saying, if you think about the model not that many years ago, you have the kind of in-person conversation, people sitting across the table, the IFA taking handwritten notes based on, based on estimates of income, et cetera, that kind of people, people have. As, and then a very kind of fairly clunky, you know, three tiers of a risk management assessment to kind of put people in buckets. Um, it's not, you know, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see that, you know, there's ways of enhancing that, that, that process. Um, so, um, uh, but so I, I think there's an awful lot of, um, a lot of space in the wealth management industry just to do the basics better, right? So how does your app work? I mean, the, uh, we've probably all written the Oliver Wyman, we've probably all read the Oliver Wyman report this year, which said that um, I think wealth managers update their apps half as often as retail banking apps, right? So there is a basic thing of the way, the way we interact now with the world is through mobile phones. You know, what, what's, your, what's your user experience like on a mobile phone as kind of basically as that? I mean, I do think, um, and then I think, um, uh, then there's a whole thing, I think, 
through the crisis, I think people realized that they were actually very comfortable with Zoom calls. They didn't have to meet in person, didn't have to fly around the world. Um, I, I mean, I do think there is, uh, there is an intimacy about the wealth management advisor relationship with their clients, which does require at some point some kind of face-to-face. -face. Um, but, but actually, I think we've all got used to you can you can feel the validity of an interaction kind of virtually so i think there's some low hanging fruit um and then i think um and then i think as colin was saying there's some certainly some stuff on the kind of plumbing plumbing side of things but look i think again i think i think you go you go back to i mean an interesting area actually is gaming i mean you look at uh what is it over three billion over three billion gamers globally um, and actually, it's quite well spread in terms of geography and, and, and demographics. So you could easily imagine a much more gamified version of wealth management. I mean, hopefully not too much like Robin Hood, but still, you know, a little bit of a, you know, the customer journey gamified through, uh, in wealth management as a way of basically engaging people. Because frankly, a lot of people have had 20 to 30 years of sitting there, not understanding the difference between an equity and a bond and 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 the whole wealth, the whole industry not being relatable. So I think there are so many ways that technology can just help, just help kind of demystify it in a way it's done very, very effectively in terms of personal communication and, and buying and retail and all of that kind of stuff. So apps, Zoom consultations, gamification, um, and indeed, you know, meeting the clients uh, digitally. Uh, but you also raised the question of, of scalability. And I, I remember two or three years ago, we talked a lot about uh, scalable intimacy. I don't even remember this phrase, but it makes me wonder whether there is um, an opportunity here to combine the best of wealth management, that personal relationship, that intimacy, if you like, with mass market products. In other words, is it possible actually to develop profitable products for the mass affluent market? And I feel we've been re we've been revisiting this repeatedly over the last ten or fifteen years. I, I seem to remember HSBC and Merrill Lynch having a plan for mass affluent products. Maybe it's ten or fifteen years ago, and, and here we are again talking about it. Is it actually possible to do this, Andy? Is it possible to create profitable mass affluent products? Yeah. Well, I think you look at Sch Schroeder's Lloyd's. There you go. That's one for starters. Um, um, you know, Schroeder's private wealth is looking to cross sell to Lloyd's mass affluent kind of client base. And I, I think actually, um, and I, I suppose I should layer on to the, the previous answer. It's not just about virtual and digital. I think there's a lot of the technology is being used to, yeah, it's a classic kind of aug augmenting the kind of human advisor. Um, so uh, I think there's an awful, you know, if you think about, a lot of advisors get get pulled down into the weeds of admin and all the rest of it, and what clients want is actual the, the kind of uh, the kind of sweet spot of of really really tailored advice. So I think a lot of what tech is doing is is making it is making the advisor time more efficient, and and particularly and I think that's pretty much across the spectrum, but particularly at the kind of ultra end, reporting systems are getting better. So it doesn't take it doesn't take the kind of the kind of wealth wealth manager you know three months to um uh three uh, you know two two weeks to put to, to to pull the stats it's there in their hands are they getting better at cross-selling as well yeah well like look i think this is all part of it, for me this insurance and household yeah presence. well for me this all this all goes back to sticky relationships right mm -hmm. if you've got a captive client base um then, I mean, if you look at the pensions world, for example, there are a number of um, pensions providers who are also part of insurance companies, right? It's a fairly, it's a fairly standard model. And, and part of what you see getting offered in workplace pensions, for example, is dis discounted insurance. And again, if you go back to the P model, why is it an attractive investment? Because you've got sticky relationships around which you can build a kind of holistic um, provision, provision of services. And again, you can there's a bolt on in, in uh, uh, you know across the spectrum. I mean, at the ultra end, there's all the kind of estate planning and legals and all the rest of that. So 
it's kind of when uh, it's this point that uh, finance and wealth, however much of it you have, is still quite central to um, to, to so many people's lives. Thanks, Andy. We've had a, a question here from Bob, Bob Bonomo at, uh, uh, looks like he's at Bernstein. Um, he says, hello, great talk. Myself and my team automated and globalized Bernstein back in the 90s from a front office decision-making perspective. Are you seeing penetration of AI, machine learning for buy-side research, portfolio construction, risk management? Colin, perhaps you'd, you'd, you have an answer to that since it's, it's an area you've actually been, been working in. Definitely. I mean, without a doubt. I mean, I wouldn't say that it's probably as advanced as people anticipate or think, and it's only as good as the data that you have in order to, you know, work the AI and the ML off. But certainly, if, you know, if you can utilize AI to take away a lot of the manual repetitive tasks and maybe forecast some things and be able to provide those um, that information in advance, it is definitely um, useful and used. And you've got a proliferation of these tools, for example, you know, in AWS or Azure or in Microsoft Stacks, you can literally plug in data sets and pretty much get some very easy type of analysis around this. Um, from a, a, a product perspective, yeah, we utilize this. I've, I've worked for GAM Investments. We have GAM Systematic. Yeah, they are purely uh, an AI quant shop. You know, they are, are driven by this and it uh, drives their allocations, um, et cetera, via AI. You know, that's how they do it in algorithms, essentially. Um, so it is definitely, definitely utilized. I think there's an extra point worth adding on as well, which is you're seeing an awful lot more of alternative data sets. So, so the days of sell side research and, and following earnings feel like they're very much on the way because actually, actually help, you know, if you're, if you're investing in the healthcare innovation space, you're using your AI to crawl over patents, patent registration to try and spot the next, the next best thing. You're not waiting for earnings. So alternative data sets are a big thing in that. I, I want to come to client service in a minute and, and I'm looking forward to hearing from, from Maya on that. But before we do that, I'd like to, to, to bring up something which has become uh, increasingly prominent in discussions about asset management and wealth management. And this is ESG. We're told all the time young people want this. We now find, in fact, regulators want it and are pressing institutional investors on this front. The question is, um, how do you deliver it? It's clearly a big opportunity. I saw a refinitive report the other day which, which estimated that this would make up uh, about 30% of global AUM already. And if it continues on that trend, this will be a $124 trillion market uh, within the next two years. Uh, they, the same report said in the first quarter of this year, you know, 36 billion went into ESG products of, of various sorts. Now, how do you as a wealth manager actually deliver this in terms of, of reporting to your clients, in terms of, of selecting investments, and in terms of these days, of course, of reporting to, to regulators as well? Presumably there's lots of um, non-financial data that you have to gather and then you have to find a way of uh, collating it, normalizing it and playing it back to the clients and, and regulators. Uh, how well placed do we think that, um, uh, and Colin, I'm gonna throw this at you first, how well placed do we think wealth managers are for the S ESG tsunami, which is clearly washing over them now in terms of technology and process preparedness? Well, I think it's, it's going to be a wide spectrum. I think there's those that are going to be accused of the greenwashing. They're doing it the simplest possible way. Um, and that might be okay for them. But I think one of the things is that it, you will be fined out. It, this is not something that you can just present but not have substance behind. So I think the ones at the, the better end of the spectrum, you know, they have it ingrained throughout their whole organisation. Um, it's right from the top down throughout all the investment teams, throughout the allocators, throughout the client relationship managers, you have this ethos. So for example, we, we've stated in our annual results last year, we're going B Corp, you know, we're, we're going all in. Um, so all the way through, we're collecting that data, it's through our investment processes. Um, it's constantly spoken about around investment meetings, around, you know, the ESG factors. We have governance teams, we're just about to appoint or have appointed a, a head of ESG um, and impact investing. And it's right the way through the organization. But to your point about the data, which is so important, you have to be able to substantiate everything you're, you're reporting. 
we we outsource we collect our own data the reporting is at an institutional grade from an outsource provider and we'll have that for all our um, products um, uh, over the, the years we'll be building that up we also have a number of other reporting mechanisms um, whether it be from a regulatory or client perspective to really substantiate our, our claims and what we're doing but as I say, it's a real purpose thing. And it's a real, it's every single individual within the organization is feeling that they're behind this. And there is a real reason, reason to do this. And I think not just COVID has accelerated this as well, because people, you know, are getting that thing. It's the generational change, you know, the impact of, you know, that boomer wealth transfer will actually affect the bottom line. You know, there are millennials and other generations that really, really are going to get affected by this. It's not made up. It is going to happen. Action needs to happen now. And they want their wealth to make a difference. And we want to be part of that. And to be part of that, you have to be genuine, authentic, and make sure that you have everything from the data right the way through to the services that you're offering totally aligned with this. I've been spending a lot of time recently talking to, to pension funds. I know this is a, a major source of anxiety for them now. Uh, and, and in a minute, Andy, I'd like to ask you uh, about whether it's a major source of anxiety among the wealth managers you talk to. But first, I thought I'd like to bring, bring, bring Maya in. The clients you're dealing with, the ultra high net worth investors, uh, are they adopting millennial style attitudes and insisting that their asset managers adopt full ESG strategies and turn themselves into B Corps and everything else or not? I, I think they are. I think um, actually it's been it's been happening, you know, on a gradual basis. But more and more, you're you know, they are the clients that are demanding their providers shift to this these types of investments. And you know, it's not just the the millennials. Um, it really is you know the ultras who tend to be you know of a certain age. Um, but but they're they're being influenced by their families. They're being influenced by you know their their colleagues, obviously. Um, and so, yeah, I'd agree with, with Colin, it, you know, it's, it's kind of, it, it's, it's a one way train here. Um, okay. So Andy, um, is this a source of mounting anxiety in the wealth management industry? I mean, GAM have obviously got it under control, but I imagine lots of people are either at the greenwashing stage or perhaps something even earlier than that. Yeah, look, I think everyone's kind of racing to have a position if they don't already have an established position. Um, and I think there's a, there's, a, there's a game being played about who can, who can make the kind of biggest statement. I mean, probably one of the kind of defining announcements in Q3 on this was UBS, who, who arguably have the largest kind of wealth management franchise globally, announcing that they were now advising, they been the first major global inst financial institution to advise their clients to prefer sustainable over traditional investments, right? So, and I think, you know, historically what's happened is um, there's been a lot of appetite to invest in this way, but not at the expense of return. So there's a huge amount of work going in to considerate, you know, consideration of returns and, and, in, and in many ways an expansion of the way in which returns are, are quantified. So a lot of work on non-financial non returns as well. But yeah, look, uh, I think everyone's got to have a position on it. And I think but I, I think it's all also a space of immense complexity um, where, um, you know, what, what is authentic ESG, right? You just seen Sir Chris Hone in you know, reporting the FT over the last couple of days, you know, having a crack at BlackRock and Vanguard and um, um, among others who are walking the talk, but, you know, are they, you know, are they really, um, are, really they, are they forcing the kind of regime change that, 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 that people are interested in? So I think, um, um, you know, I think it's across the industry. I think the pensions area is particularly interesting as well. So I've, uh, I worked on a project recently where I was talking to um, sale, sales people who were, who were involved in selling, selling workplace pensions. And they basically said to me, we spent 20 to 30 years trying to explain to audiences the differences between an equity and bond and no one cares and, and and no one no one no one got it and they and they actually thinking about esg as a way of engaging attention 
uh, kind of because because you're engaging on kind of themes that people are reading about socially that they're thinking about in terms of their own employer as a way of people actually engaging with their money in a way which hasn't happened in the last 20 30 years so i think there's an awful lot of hope behind esg but there's a lot of complexity and nuance around it as well let's talk a little bit about about client experience client service now um I'm not sure how, how, how easy it is to actually divide these two from each other, but I think they are separate, separate issues. Uh, uh, Maya, the, the clients that you're interviewing, how important is a, a digital experience and a digital form of, uh, of service to them? In other words, do they expect to meet their, their private wealth manager face to face once a quarter, or are they, would they prefer to have a a digital encounter with them once a week or whatever what's what's their attitude it's a funny one because it you know i think these things are changing so traditionally they would have wanted this face-to-face -face, um, meeting but absolutely it, you know they're realizing that you know in the comfort of their own homes they're actually you know getting quite a lot done and they're quite you know kind of learning that they can be happy with that but i think i wanted to you know kind of go back, I think it was Peter who mentioned that, um, you know, I think the, the wealthy, what they want and what they kind of ask from their wealth advisors is, you know, quite a lot of different questions. And it's, you know, it can be sometimes quite hard to satisfy all of those um, types of questions. And, and so um, they are kind of, they're kind of a catch all and, and it's really at the ultra level, it's all about trust and, and bringing in other people to, to be able to help those, um, to, to be able to help their clients. Um, but I think in terms of technology, I think where the power is, is that these ultras, they really want fast, that they want to be able to, uh, you know, see their reporting quickly. They want to be able to uh, look at, you know, the, the real time state of their investments. And so, that type of front end technology is really important to, to, you know, to the wealthy and, and um, will, you know, will kind of continue to, to be so, but ultimately the, you know, ultras, they, they do want that face to face. They do want that um, extra kind of human element. And I don't think that's kind of going away because um, that's something that technology can't provide, you know, in the total. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bob. Peter, is this, this makes me think, is, is, is a digital experience in wealth management a contradiction in terms? Because was what Maya's just been saying there, that the client actually wants the face-to-face -face contact, expects the human contact, expects this person to be at their beck and call to provide a concierge service or, or whatever it is. Um, it, can, can you digitize the client experience at the upper end as well as the lower end? Um of the wealth spectrum I was referring yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. If, if, so, I mean, the answer to that is really, you know, deep understanding of what, what clients want whenever, whenever they receive advice. Um, they actually want different things. I mean, you know, all, all people are different and, and you know, customer clients are not homogenous in, in, in what they want. Um, you know, the, the, the dynamics of our industry and I'll talk about financial advisors and wealth managers. I appreciate that there's a there's a blurred line somewhere in between. Um, the latest stats are there are 27,000 advisors in in the UK. There are four and a half million paying clients. There are 10 million who want to pay for financial advice in some form or another, and the 30 million who are willing to engage um, digitally uh, and want some of financial uh, guidance. So there's a a five and a half million people advice gap, and a 25 million guidance gap. So these are the real dynamics of our of, of our of our broader market. Then if you look at if you look at um, uh, uh, wealth managers, so so wealth managers typically have clients um, higher net worth and ultra high net worth, um, but, but that that doesn't mean that they're any less likely to want to engage digitally. But what they do want is they certainly want they're much more demanding. They certainly want to speak to their their, their wealth manager when they want, not when the wealth manager wants. So the only way you can do this, the only way you can provide this personal service, 
is to is to use technology or you can carry on doing what you're doing and you'll be able to see fewer clients um, and you'll be able to do it less well um, so if you so if you take if you take um, the, the the broad dynamics for our industry and the huge gap that we've got if you look at all of, and, and some of all the other questions that we've been through like our wealth managers good at, at cross-selling um, and, and this is wrapped up in the question that you just asked well, people will only be good at cross-selling if there's some form of reward for them um, or if they're going to feel good about what they do. And if they're no good at cross-selling into, into the products or service, um, then they're not going to do it because they're not going to enjoy it. They're not going to feel good about themselves. Um, and and the, the, the solution for all of these things is uh, using technology. So if you're able to, for example, if a, if a client calls and says something that usually makes most advisors, whether they're wealth managers or IFAs, that makes their heart sink like I want to top up my pension or I want to put £5,000 into an ISA or something ridiculous. You're obliged to do it, um, but you don't really want to because it's, it doesn't offer any great reward for you. And actually, all of this can and already is digitised. So you can, you can give digital financial advice, fully digital doing straight, straightforward uh, pension accumulation. So my pension ac accumulation at Wealth Wizards is where I work. That was done fully, fully digitized. You can do an ISA. So we have live cases uh, right now. It's fully digitized, fully regulated financial advice. If you can do that as a wealth manager, some of these more simple things, um, then you can embrace technology and use it to give actually much better higher quality advice that your clients really want and that you actually enjoy so um so 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 a, a you know a computer you know or a piece of robo advice will never be able to look a client in the eye when they've just inherited half a million pounds and they're pleased but at the same time they're bereaved and they will never be able to to, to give them that personal warmth um but it will just give them more time to be able to do that Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we might come back to, to whether you can digitize tax and investment and pension advice. Yeah, yeah, but, but in the meantime, we've had a very, very interesting question about an aspect of client service, which is often, I think, underestimated. It's one of my favorite subjects, so I'm very excited by this. Um, uh, one of our member audience has said, why, doesn't wealth, why don't wealth management companies implement technology for the registration process? I mean, for example, if I want to be a client of UBS, Credit Suisse, or any other major player, I have to fill in a form and after I get a call back from a relationship manager would ask how much investable assets I have and set up an appointment to discuss my financial goals. The process in my opinion is endless. Robo-advisors have created a great registration process asking level of wealth, risk tolerance, showing scenarios and track record. Why this technology is not implemented by the major wealth management firms. I understand wealth management involves other services, you know, succession plans, tax, et cetera, but the core business is asset allocation, discretionary advice or execution, all other services are, in my opinion, satellite services which could be cross-selling. So back to the question, why don't wealth management companies implement technology for the registration process? I'd like to add to that um, the onboarding process. Once you once you had had this interview, you then have to do the KYC, AML, CFT, sanction screening checks as well. Um, the, the industry talks about single sign-on. It talks about federated identities. I haven't seen it talk that much about digital identities, but clearly that process could also be made um, efficient. This is an example of, of relationship management, you know, gone berserk, if you like. It's they're kind of overdoing aspects of, of, of the service and should be perhaps doing a little less and a little more of what Peter has talked about, which is doing the boring stuff using technology and more efficiently. But I'm not a member of the panel. I shouldn't be expressing opinions like this. Um, Colin, uh, What's your answer to our to our member of our audience? Why isn't the wealth management industry doing this stuff much more efficiently? They should be. They're crazy if they're not. I mean, it, it's just that simple. Um, it, it should be happening. There's many systems out there that can enable this to happen. Um, Are you doing it though at GAM? We've just done our onboarding process. Yeah, we're B2B, so we're not really direct to consumer. So mm -hmm. we have a, an onboarding process that's integrated directly into our dynamic CRM system, and directly through to the relationship managers and our compliance team. So if you imagine that end-to-end -end workflow, 
you'll come on board, bring in the distribution agreements, those type of things, and it will all happen as part of... Uh, but you still have to do the KYC AML stuff on, all, on yeah, distributors, um, right? We do. Yeah, all, all of that stuff is, is automated via um, checks and approvals via the appropriate compliance teams. Uh, and yeah, it goes through a process. But in terms of a direct to consumer, if you know you don't have a simple identity for an individual, you know, that you can have a trusted, you know, sovereign identity, a passport or whatever, et cetera, and work through those key small steps that are very easily achievable nowadays online. And then open up an account to be able to profit from the services that the wealth manager can provide. You know, you do have to have your head looked at because it's kind of the quickest win to remove the friction. The people are then on board. But the thing is, you've got to back it up afterwards with then a digital journey to a degree afterwards as well. So, you know, the onboarding is one thing, but you do have to keep following that up. Um, and equally, it's the same the other side. If someone wants to leave, you should make it equally as easy. Mm -hmm. So you'd be a fan of digital identities. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Um, and you think the industry could do a lot better uh, in answer to our to member of audience here in, in terms of how they register you, if you like, at the, at the outset and how they build the relationship. Digital identity would unlock a lot of stuff throughout the whole economy, essentially, as well as this process. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm glad you, we're, we're big fans of digital identities at Future of Finance as well. Um, Andy, did you want to, 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 to add something to, to that? Um, um, just a kind of high level point, I guess, that, um, you know, if you take the parallel with the banks, um, the banks were not, it, the reason we have a fintech sector is that the banks were not themselves terribly capable at effectively taking the interesting UX um, and CX experience that should have been developed in things like personal communications and retail and applying them to banking. And why is that? Because they're often bogged down with, you know, they have embedded systems of doing things as well as tech systems, which mean that they're not terribly fleet of foot in terms of coming up with new solutions. I think the interesting thing about the wealth management sector is, so uh, there's the same opportunity in a way to start with a blank sheet of paper and say, look, we can do things differently. We can do things better. I think the challenge is um, wealth management. You know, we talked about that 12 year stat for client longevity. Arguably the client relationships are much stickier in, in kind of wealth management. So, um, um, so if you look at Robo, I think that the cost of acquisition for new clients it has been quite tricky for some, for, for some of those players. So, so they are, have inherently better ways of doing things like onboarding and like all the other things. But, but how do they get the clients to build scale to make the business model work is, the, is a bit the macro point. But yeah, I mean, I agree with Colin. It's, it's, um, and I think, you know, fast forwarding a bit to, to, to potentially, a, you know, who are the future winners, losers in the losers camp will, like, will be those that fail to, that are still, that are still form filling in five, 10 years time. Right. Andy, can I, can I, we're running out of time here. We've only got about five or six minutes left, but I've got to just ask your opinion very briefly on one thing, which was touched upon earlier about one of the things that's what Peter was saying, really, if you do the boring stuff, using technology it actually frees up time to do the interesting stuff and yep. you can get paid more for it so to what what extent is it actually possible to digitize investment advice pension advice tax advice legal advice to provide a, a holistic service to the clients can technology does technology exist to enable wealth managers to do that if it's yep. using ai or ml or whatever okay so my take on this uh but others will have have their own view is that uh, i mean I don't even think it's AI, right? It's just machine learning. I mean, AI is supposed to be something more than just, you know, repeat rules. Actually, there's a lot of elements of wealth management and wealth planning that lend themselves perfectly to reducing to a series of, of machine learned, learned steps with, with, with better identity. I mean, what's really, what would be really interesting is if you get open source banking and other ways where, again, to go back to our, in the real world, how has this actually been done previously? It's the individual sitting across a table guessing at figures, right? Whereas if you could find a way of giving access to actual real income and expenses and all of that kind of stuff, 
then it, it's not hard to see how you could program um, a kind of much more tailored, much more bespoke view of, of, of kind of financial planning. And, and, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, I think there's an awful lot of fairly basic um, financial low hanging fruit that, that, that could be captured. I mean, I read a stat the other day that in the UK, 50% of all ISAs are in cash cash ISAs, right? So no one's really using all of the kind of income shielding benefits benefits of ISAs. So I think, um, so yeah, so I, I think it's twofold. We talked earlier in the call, it, it's part of this is about making the advisors more efficient. So there's, or the time of the advisors more efficient. So they get to spend more of the time getting to the heart of much more qualitative issues, which do, which do probably need talking, talking through. And I guess as a related point, as part of that, I think you can deal with a lot of the BAU on a on a on a kind of um, uh, pro programmatize the kind of rules based processes that the that, that advisors go through anyway. OK, thanks, Andy. Um, I'm glad you brought up the question of, of open data because um, it, it's it's an interesting aspect of this whole discussion that we're having we're sadly running out of time to so talk about it for long but Maya you've heard Andy talk about how open data will put information data in the hands of wealth managers which at the moment they're having to ask the client for and you know please hand over your bank statements and they're digging out handwritten notes and all the rest of a very inefficient process open data makes it possible to see into their bank account see their spending patterns see how much they spend on energy what the school fees are costing etc um, how much do, at the top end of the market, how much do uh, ultra high net worth wealth managers actually know about their clients? Do they know everything? Is it a model which could be useful for lower down the wealth scale? I mean, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting one. I think, you know, at the ultra level, uh, you know, they tend to have multiple wealth managers. So you only know, you know, a portion of what your client is actually doing. You know, they have at least three if not, you know, more wealth managers and they, they come to, to those kind of individuals for different reasons. Um, so, yeah, so this is, this is a, a very interesting one. I mean, down, I can see it has you know, lots of potential further down the, further down the wealth kind of pyramid. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Colin, how much do you know about your distributors? You're a B2B business. You're not looking at the end investor, but do you feel you have a very good picture of, which distributors are selling which products where and who they're selling them to and how profitable they are and what your distribution agreements with them are. Do you have a the reason? Yes. Yeah, we do. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, we, we consolidate everything into a, a central CRM system um, and that has all our reporting from it. But there are the inherent challenges, you know, whether that's this look through to, you know, distributors or platforms and who the end investor is, you know, those type of challenges are industry challenges. Um, there is no real solution for that at the moment. So you have to do the best you can. Um, you know, everyone's got the eye on potentially blockchain to actually have that end client in mind, but you know, give us 20 years and that might happen. Um, Talking of blockchain, um, and we really are gonna to have to stop quite soon. Can I ask you a question about the extent to which you see wealth managers getting involved in cryptocurrencies and security tokens? And I ask you that question because uh, I, I saw a report the other day which said that illiquid assets make up 40% of, of global wealth. Uh, it's a non-correlated asset class. Uh, wealthy people tend to be early into these, uh, into these new fields. They tend to own things like works of art and classic cars and uh, historic coins. Uh, and they could, by using this technology, continue to enjoy the benefit of owning those objects while actually raising some, some money from them because you can fragment the painting hanging on the on the wall. Um, do you do you see wealth managers being, as a result of the nature of their clients, as being early adopters of security tokens, particularly for illiquid asset classes? I do. I think it's probably one of the first that will go there. You know, there is the demand there. People will want it. it Remind me a little bit of when you know first hedge funds. It's that type of thing. You know, it was to the the mass wealth. Sorry, the, the high net worth. Those type of individuals. They had access to those type of things because they could afford to take the risks. You know, and the returns were there. But I think the really really important thing is around the due diligence that the wealth manager needs to take. 
you know, to make sure that the product that they're actually giving to their clients is actually fit, is good, is fit for purpose. And in the same way as hedge funds, they won't blow up, which some of them do. Uh, Maya, you're not seeing in, in, in the data you're collecting a growing appetite for tokenized assets, particularly on the, say, the ESG side. We were talking earlier about how very wealthy people are influenced by their children. They're like the rest of us. They want to be seen to, to be investing wisely and prudently in the world. But you're not picking up an early appetite for tokens. Not quite yet. I think I think it's early, early, uh, early days. But you know, they they will be one of you know they will be the risk takers. Yep. Okay. Now our, our time is almost up, so I think we might just try and wrap it up just by. Uh, and you'd begun to touch on this, Andy. So I'll, I'll come to you first about this. Uh, if you could think about the wealth management business of the future, uh, I don't know how far the future is away. Maybe five, ten, could be fifteen years. Whatever you like. Um, but which, which, what are the characteristics of the successful wealth manager of the future going to be? Um, tech enabled one, bit of a no brainer given this, given the, yeah. given the whole topic of this conversation. Uh, I guess license to operate and values based is, is another one. And then I think um, to one of Peter's points earlier, I, I think extremely clear on its um, uh, on its audience and its channel. So you know, again, I think um, I think there's an argument to say the wealth management industry has been able to survive for decades, possibly centuries, relatively uh, uh, relatively stable, relatively. Um, uncompeted and I think and I think it's going to be like all other sectors where there are no prizes for turning up and so you need to you need to have edge you need to have best in class you need to be very focused on on your market. Peter would you would you describe you were very articulate about this earlier your image of the successful wealth manager of the future is one who, who gets all the boring stuff done very efficiently using technology and reserves all its time for the complicated stuff which builds relationships and builds assets. Would that be a fair summary of your view of the successful wealth manager of the future? In, in any industry where, where new technology comes along, um, even if we don't like it, even if we've, we've spent a whole generation or series of generations being comfortable with the status quo um you, you have no op no option but to to change or, or just get left behind or be very niche so so the sort of technology that is coming so the question that that got asked before and it was quite right didn't come to me is can we digitize you know advice well well investment accumulation advice pension accumulation advice, pension consolidation advice, um, pension decumulation advice. Um, this is all digitized now and it's active and it's live. So, so we do all this at the same time onboarding. So, so you know, fact finder, your client risk profiling, um, all, of, all the boring stuff, that's fully digitized. Uh, and we do that too. And there are others that do this. And it, it will get better and better and better. Um, so if, if you don't do this, if, if as wealth managers you don't embrace this technology, uh, you will just not be efficient enough to survive in anything other than a, a, a niche way. So I'm not ex-military, but I know plenty of people who, you know, who, who are and have been, especially in our industry too. You, know, you think of the wealth manager in the future will be like a, a highly trained special forces soldier where they, they are multi-skilled, but ultimately they're paid to be the best at what they can be and to be a real thinker. Um, that doesn't mean that we, we don't use our intelligence, our, our personal service and our humanity. It means that we use technology to be the best that we can be. And uh, that's, that's where we'll be in the next five and 10 years. So Maya, the, the wealth manager as, as the special forces soldier, hmm the highly trained and probably highly expensive uh, uh, individual. What's, what's your image of the, of, the, 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 uh, of the wealth manager of the future? Well, wow, that's a new one. Yeah, I'm going to have to 
you know, rethink my image. Uh, no, go ahead, Peter. I, I, no, I was going to say I'm I'm just a, an accountant, so I, I don't have to worry about such sort of macho uh, machoism. I, I was just worrying that, an, that a, a, a special forces soldier is probably very expensive to train and get to that to that level of of expertise. It's actually a very good analogy, but just um, I was making a joke about how expensive it might be. Um, Maya, you were did you want to to offer us a view of the wealth manager of the future or not? Well, I, I mean, I think the, the the wealth manager future is a bit, you know, it kind of going in, in you know, some trends and, and things we're seeing today. They're going to, you know, hopefully there'll be a, mer, a more kind of diverse, uh, you know, group of people. I think there's the, you know, the diversity is, is kind of one that's being sought by wealth managers. Um, so that that's certainly one, I think, more... <laughs> Yeah. Again, I think, you know, what Peter was saying about being a thinker, I think that is going to be more and more in demand by the wealthy. They want a wealth manager that can really understand the complexities of their situation. Um, and they don't want to be waste time on, on the boring stuff. They want technology to deal with that and then mm -hmm. to really use their time with their wealth manager to the, to the kind of, to their greatest benefit. Okay, so thoughtful, diverse, understands complexity and uses technology well. Um, that's a clear vision. Thank you, Maya. Colin, a, a last word from you about the wealth manager of the future. I mean, I think there's two two paths, aren't there? You either go for for scale through automation, or you kind of you, you've got to be distinctive by using tech, and you know that's going to be around you know focusing on people and purpose, and you know to Maya's point about diversity of thought, those type of things where you, You've actually got an authentic proposition, but really you've got to be smart and adapt to, adept to actually combining those resources and integrating those resources to deliver your end client the services that they demand and want to pay for. And I really like the special services or special forces analogy because it is that type of thing, but in a digital space, you know, because that's where these services will be. You're going to have to be really, really, really good at actually connecting things, have the infrastructure to make those work, to give a seamless experience and client um, journey for these guys when they're interacting with you. Because if you can't do that, then you're not a special service. You can't actually do anything. You, you just end up being the home guard, you know. Mm -hmm. That's a nice note to end on. The Special Forces Soldier in Wealth Management stands on top of a very solid, very complex infrastructure of data and uh, digital services. Uh, sadly, I think that's where we will have to stop. Uh, it remains for me only to thank our panellists, uh, Andy Knox as himself, um, Colin Bennett from GAM, uh, Maya Imberg from WealthX and uh, Peter Coleman from, from Wealth Wizards. And thank you also to, you, to the audience for your, for your interest and especially your questions and comments, uh, which I think we all enjoyed. Uh, at Future of Finance, our next webinar is on the 12th of November. It's on foreign exchange. It's a strange lack of technological disruption. And we look forward to as many as possible of you joining us then. Thank you and goodbye from the five of us. Thank you, Dominic, and thank you to our panel. If you would like to see the summary of this discussion, please visit our website on www.futureoffinance.biz. And indeed, if you would like to see the video again, that is also on our website. Many thanks. <laughs>